Deepa. Um, what a pleasure to have you on my podcast. Um, I have been chasing you literally, I think, uh, for some some time now. Uh, I know that you've been very busy. You've been traveling. Um, it's very nice to hear all these things, uh, especially during this time. So, uh, welcome to, of course, the Second Act podcast. Uh, this podcast is essentially a space where I want to bring in stories. which can inspire somebody which can move somebody which can give a direction to somebody like you just mentioned that everybody has something innate probably we don't pay attention to you know either ourselves or in others uh, and there is something which is very underlying and you know where we can also derive self motivation and sometimes when we are losing it uh, a conversation a book somebody's quotation it really helps to pull us back and you know show us some positivity so without uh, you know uh, giving a spiel about the sec- second act podcast i also want to introduce you my dear so for people who are hearing us and also you know on uh, youtube if you're seeing us i want to tell you that uh, deepak at this young age of course uh, is a founder and artistic director of project fuel i want to ask him about uh the name itself and what is this project fuel uh, in a while uh he is a tedx speaker and a un action plan executor he serves as a kindness ambassador at uh, for unesco uh mgiep and um he's written a beautiful book um we will know more about it it, it was very famous and he's also worked with the stalwarts like amitabh bachchan farhan akhtar rekha bhardwaj uh and many others uh and one lots of accolades lots of titles so welcome deepak it's a honor to have you my dear friend and a inspiration uh, for many of us thank you so much uh, ashna uh, for the kind introduction um thank you while you were chasing me i was trying to chase some stories uh, on the other side of the world and it's it's wonderful to have conversations so very delighted to be here Yes, I think Second Act is a platform where we say learnings happen through conversations, and this is one thing that I'm hoping to learn today a lot from you. So, tell me a little bit about uh, you, Deepak. Your background. What have you studied, and how did you land up in doing whatever you're doing through your fuel project and other things like writing a book and also maybe writing songs? And uh, you know, the voice is given by Amitabh Bachchan and the likes. but let's start from you know what did you study and how did you land up here uh i studied uh science when i was in school mm-hmm. um and uh, then in college i did mass media i um, loved storytelling and uh, i wanted to understand how i could better present storytelling and growing up in dehradun in a middle class family in a small town uh for me storytelling the most medium was uh, either film making or was journalism and when i saw that mass communication was a course my parents were comfortable allowing me to you know go uh, because i was a science student and you know um, i had uh, given exams for iit and ai triple e i thought i could bargain for a mass media uh, you know uh, career <laughs> and so that's that's what i i studied and um the the work that i do now happened parallelly with uh, my schooling with my college i was very passionate about people and i had been collecting stories and le- learnings of people since i was 14 years old uh, i uh, you know tell the story of 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 my mother who was pulled out of school in grade 5 by her grandmother who didn't want to go uh, didn't want her to go to uh, school to study with boys or study at all and my mother despite not having formal education is one of the smartest people i know on planet earth very articulate very very sensitive very empathetic uh very um, you know uh, fluent in expressing her thoughts and i thought she must be lying about not going to school but it's only later that i realized that it is true that she didn't go to school but she also believed that the world is her classroom and she's been learning from living and that inspired me very early on i thought my mother uh, has gained so much from people let me also uh, you know try to pull that uh, or harvest that knowledge from people so i started collecting life lessons 
from a very early age at 14. And I had collected so many that had helped me uh, by the age of 17 that the only way uh, to move forward was to pass them on. So I started teaching, uh, you know, this unique subject of human wisdom. Wow. And Where was 13 that? years. Uh, I started teaching all across India uh, in the beginning when I was 17, primarily Mumbai because I was there. So I worked with National Association for the Blind. I worked with several NGOs, uh, worked with architectural colleges, um, and just with the intention of passing on these exemplary stories of what a grandmother uh, in you know Northeast has learned in six to two years of her life and what a 13-year-old child in Punjab has learned. I wanted to cross-pollinate learning. And 13 years later, uh, it has become a field of study of its own. Human wisdom uh, is as precious as really a precious stone is in the world and, uh, you know, but not as exploited or understood. So we have 7 billion people on planet Earth, but how many stories of those 7 billion do we really know? Uh, it's usually the rich and famous. And so my mission in life is to shine light onto the stories of those who don't feel the need to invent, the app, invent an app or raise a million dollar uh, seed funding uh, investor round or are not going to sign up to the Miss World contest. People who are helping the world go round and are still important because uh, they sweep the streets or they are grandmothers who raised phenomenal children who will invent all of those things. Uh, I'm trying to celebrate their stories and their knowledge. Yeah, beautiful. I think um, somewhere the second act platform celebrating stories, we are celebrating ourselves. Uh, you know, we tell people to really recognize the potential that they have, all the roles that we play and how important they are and how good it is to have some self-worth. Because um, mm -hmm. in times, you know, when um, nobody supports you, you have to support your own self and, you know, pick yourself up and feel really good about who you are because there is only one life, isn't it? And you yes. do it at such a young age, uh, which is quite commendable. Um, but just on the side note, so what's the revenue model like? So do you like, you know, curate stories and, you know, is there somewhere that you're collecting them? Are people engaging with you in a certain manner? What do you do with that? Uh, there's a whole framework. I mean, Fuel has its own methodology that's been recognized as world's top 100 innovations in education. Wow. Uh, and has been adopted by countries such as Belgium, uh, you know, in the United States, uh, by the city of Pittsburgh, in Nepal, in, uh, in parts of South America. We have a, a, a framework that we work with. We have verticals. So one vertical is education. The methodology is adopted by uh, education boards, institutions. We work with uh, nonprofit organizations, create curriculums or seek in our consultation for, uh, you know, uh, culture, but also educational programming. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. So Deepak, um, I want to start with, of course, literally now the next step, the fuel project, like you said. So how did the thought come to you and uh, the name itself? Um, where did you start? Was it something that you were building on already, like you said, you know, while you were studying, it came to you. And um, how old is your company? I, it's 13 years. Oh, I started. Yeah, I started when I was 17. And we incorporated it uh, in 2014, uh, 2013 and 2014 beginning. So it became a registered uh, organization somewhere around that time. But the work had been happening uh, for four to five years before that as well, uh, or much longer than that, almost six years before that. Uh, the inspiration for the idea I mentioned to you, my mother was, you know, a big spark to it. And just the need to share that knowledge uh, was what led to creating the organization and doing the workshops and traveling and creating curriculums. Uh, the name Fuel came from just uh, what I wanted to do with the work, what the service inspired. I was collecting people's life lessons and I wasn't just forwarding the life lesson. I was forwarding the understanding of those life lessons. And that's where the methodology plays a key role, where we don't just collect people's stories. We actually design that through a process, through a structure into experiential learning programs and into uh, modules. 
and uh, yeah i mean once i i was paying attention to that that i'm really forwarding the understanding of every life lesson that acronym became fuel and i said that's what i also want to do with the wisdom i want to fuel people and when you when you uh, delve more into it you understand that your understanding is informed by somebody else's knowing of something better uh, because you can't live all the lives that exist in the world so the name came from that uh, you know just observation and and paying attention to how i was feeling and what we were doing perfect i mean it sounds like uh, you know we are very well designed while um, at this age to be honest uh, the the kind of clarity that you already had before you started the journey is uh, unheard of by many of us to be honest i mean we normally fall into the grind of doing you know what's expected to do pad liya you know you've done your graduation okay now find a job you work for some time then you feel okay am i cut out for it or not and then what should i do but i think you've paved your life pretty well and i should applaud you and i'm hoping that you know so many of the younger lot who are hearing us uh, are inspired by your story and uh, you know do Thank something you. about it <laughs> okay so um so coming from of course your life lessons of course you also coined a book which was very interesting and the title itself is the 50 toughest questions one should ask and um do you want to talk a little bit more about it i i read through it i you know i really enjoyed that book because you can pick up from somewhere and you know there is a lesson everywhere in that book but tell us more about it for people to know uh, the book is titled 50 toughest questions of life and uh, it's really inspired from the life lesson of a young student from uh, afghanistan uh, in kabul particular i was teaching there and uh, the school was shut down by the taliban but the life lesson of one of the young girls to me was that life is not about giving easy answers it's about answering tough questions and it put me on this spiral that what are tough questions and who's asking them so as a personal project i documented nearly 3000 toughest questions one could answer about one's own life and when i combed through those lessons for myself with people uh they narrowed down to 480 320 150 and eventually became the 50 toughest questions of life and i used to play it as a dating exercise game if i was going to see somebody new i would ask them 50 questions about their life and i i would get to know a great deal uh you know beyond the small talk and then i played it with friends and family and teams and classrooms and um, eventually all of those people caught up with me and said we loved the questions but we have forgotten many of them and we want to go back and revisit and i thought let me let me create these questions into a book so that people have the ammunition that they need time and again to revisit this these questions and they can also map out their answers you know some answers hopefully will remain same throughout life and some answers need to change based on the growth you are seeking and having in life beautiful and so which are your favorite questions from there that you revisit time and again for yourself uh there are so many i mean all of those 50 questions are, mm-hmm. a lot of times i say to my my family that the book i wrote for myself because a lot of times when i'm having a down day i go to the book and i flip a question my my favorite question in the book is how can someone make you feel loved uh there is so much of guessing game as to how to please other people how to uh you know pacify how to compliment how to cheer up somebody that when somebody decides to reflect on their own way through their own introspection how they can be made to feel more loved and then communicate that it becomes so much more easier uh, for other people to participate and and share that uh, you know uh, uh, process with the person so this is one of the questions that you go back to um so between the question and the answer so who decides what's the right answer there is no right answer that mm-hmm. is the beauty of the book and the questions Uh, to say that there is a right answer is to actually operate from a very microscopic tunnel view of the world uh, i hope there is no right answer and i hope the answers evolve for people uh, and that is why you know when you see the book by design the uh, you know my suggestions or my reflections don't come on the same page the question in the book has been given its dedicated page so that you can pause and you can answer that question uh we live in a world 
that our questions create. We don't live in a world that our answers create. The answers keep on dynamically shifting towards whatever you're feeling. And everybody feels differently at different points of, of, of the day and time. And so uh, I, I, I really hope that people don't anchor themselves and pin themselves to a, to a conventional mindset of this is the right answer to the question. Increasingly in the world, we need things you can't find on a Google search. If I was to write, uh, you know, uh, what does pain that no longer hurt morph into for Archana, I don't think so I can Google that answer. I think I will have to ask you and understand that. And maybe that answer will be something today and something else tomorrow. And to hold space for that, I think is one of the purpose of these questions and the book itself. Very well written, to be honest, and I applaud you for that. You know, not only uh, probing them further, but uh, an observation and awareness around what you have done is amazing. Just like I just observed that, um, you know, you were looking at a bird which was uh, right next to you uh, in our, uh, again, you know, in our not being so mindful in a day, uh, we just lose so many beautiful things which are around us. And I think, um, thankfully, during pandemic, a lot of us started becoming very self-aware and, you know, we we were caged in. And so we didn't have a choice but to look around and find beauty around us. But this has to be the norm. This has to be the norm to uh, spread joy and love and life. Um, because if you need to make the most of what you have, uh, it's best that you put a smile on it and like, you know, feel good about uh, you know, expressing and emoting and also observing. <laughs> so thanks. Absolutely. Deepak, you are doing a great job. Uh, you talk about also being uh, not a star yourself, um, also call yourself um, a jack of all trades. Uh, you know, you are one person who is saying that, okay, I am just that source, but, um, you know, my destination is somewhere else or like, you know, so what is that philosophy that you follow? Uh, growing up, uh, I think we were told to be the master of one trade and not the jack of all trades. And I wanted to be jack consciously, primarily because I, for my own journey, accepted that it is one life and you are going to die. That is going to happen. And that is the most unknown and the most uncertain of adventures you have signed up for already by default. Which means that anything that falls under it, writing a song, doing a book, performing in front of 20,000 people, traveling the world, being in a community, be as scary, as uncertain, and as unknown. Hmm. And I wanted to do and learn all of those things. Hmm. So I became very early on very comfortable being Jack. Uh, and in fact, Traditionally, not many people know this, but the whole proverb is uh, jack of all trades, master of none, still better than doing just one, yeah. which means yes. that it promoted versatility, it promoted diversity. And so I come from the philosophy that if you can balance uh, beautifully, then you must experience as many things you can. And actually, the role is not to do just one thing. The role is to do many things and then find a way to merge them into that one thing so it becomes a cohesive story. That's a big responsibility. I don't think so many people take it up. Mm. Fair enough. It also demands accountability and ownership. And we don't have that kind of bandwidth in our daily routines to not just do one thing, but do 10 things and then find what is the thing between them. I see my life as a river and I see all the things I do as the tributaries. They all originate from the same source, which is to tell a better story, which is to live in a beautiful world. And um, about the, the philosophy of not being a star, I actually um, <laughs> probably go beyond and say the, the, the pursuit is of being a constellation. Because by default, we all are stars. Everybody has something valuable. Uh, and so when we label somebody a star, we try to say others are asteroids and meteorites in the solar system. <laughs> uh, but everybody is a star. And what the increasingly our purpose can be is of being a constellation. Because a constellation has to derive from the patterns and the possibilities of others. And, uh, you know, it's more meaningful. It's more, you can, you can pull it out and pick it out in the night sky when you look up. 
And so collaboration is one way to do it. When you see my work, from the point we are collecting a life lesson of somebody to the point we are going and disseminating it, collaboration is at the heart of the work. And uh, for me, um, Archana, that is really a, a, a principle that I believe invested in that we all are given tasks or pick up tasks and that those tasks need to be done and need to take certain amount of time. So when people say, oh my God, you're 30 and you've already done everything. I think my, my work uh, needed 13 years of homework so that I could get started now beyond 30. Yes. I think if I would have picked up the, the concept of human wisdom today, I would have spent 13 years just doing the research that I've done in the 13 years uh, to propel myself forward. So because the exam is so big, you have to do the prep as early as you could. Um, and I am, I'm, just, I'm just trying to formulate, discover for myself what is thrilling, how people adapt. COVID has been a you know, curveball mm -hmm. that so many people have adapted to, as you mentioned. And um, the, the survival techniques that an Archana Datta might have or a Deepak Ramola might have can come to inform uh, a young girl in Tanzania or a young woman's learnings from uh, New Zealand can come to inform a 14-year-old boy in Gujarat. So, but how to make those possibilities? How, how to make sure that that woman doesn't have to be on Instagram to make that happen? She can be where she is. We have to become bridges. We have to become those tributaries. We have to reach them. And uh, hopefully, all of it, when it comes together, we can see that we are part of the same ocean or we land at the same ocean, you know, for, for a lack of a better metaphor. Uh, yeah, that's how I really see those two philosophies. I can only tell you, Deepak, that, um, you know, the, the way my day started yesterday and today, uh, it was quite a dip in my energy. And, uh, you know, you're talking to you. I feel um, positive and uh, ignited. And I'm feeling really good talking to you because there's so much hope that you have in your voice, in um, the work that you're doing. And of course, the way that you have, uh, you know, taken the discovery phase, um, you know, really seriously and uh, are out to provide that very basic joy in the world. It's, it's very beautiful. And thank you so much, I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you. No, that's very kind of you. But really, there is no better time, despite the news, our feeds on social media, there has never been a better time in the world to be alive. When could common people uh, sitting in Gurgaon, in Dehradun, impact somebody uh, in society? It was always people with power and privilege. You could start second act, leave a job, uh, find people to have a conversation. Uh, not 20 not years not, ago. Yes. Not yeah, even, not not even 10 years, years ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not even a few years ago. And, you know, so in a decade's time, we now have the potential to be wherever we are, pick up our phones, pick up our audio recorders and create content, create stories, create narratives that can come to influence generations and generations of people. The common person has never had so much power. And I think when we focus so much on everything that's going downhill, we forget everything that's rising up. Uh, we are the mountains and the river has to flow through us. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the volcanoes are going to be there, but we are also the mountains that the rivers have to flow through. And so my hope is not a, is not a dumbfounded hope uh, in the world that we live in. It's, it's a factual um, you know, a militant optimism that is rooted in science and that's rooted in possibilities of seeing how we have changed and how we've evolved. Um, I just came from Tanzania and spent a month with the Maasai tribe. I don't think so that if you were not an anthropologist or an ethnographer uh, 10 years ago, you could have this sort of an engagement and this sort of, a, uh, you know, uh, time and accessibility to a community outside of your job. I'm taking that and I'm putting it in school textbooks because I, as an educator, want to bring in perspective. And that freedom of choice, of creation, of understanding is my knowledge. And so, you know, if you don't have hope, your knowledge is redundant. 
you can have two MBBSs and you can stand at a surgery table with your scalpel and say, I can't do anything even before you have touched the patient. And in that moment, a doctor is not run by his degrees. He's run by his hope or she's run by his hope that, okay, let me try. And hopefully mm -hmm. I, can, I can make the right cut and the right stitch and the right medication. And this person will see another light of the day. So I think our hope is our knowledge. And, uh, you know, people who say they are hopeless, I think are, um, you know, the, uh, I am no, I'm thinking of many Hindi words, but they are actually talking hypocrisy because you feed on the hope of so many people. If you had organic food for lunch, if you had a salad, if you had rice, the farmer sowed the seeds and was hopeful for the rain to come. So you're being served hope on your plate. Uh, you know, the, the bus driver, the ambulance you will call if you fall sick is a hope economy that you live in. And then to dismiss everybody else's hope that they have served to you on a platter by saying <laughs> it's a hopeless world is a big disservice. So uh, sorry for the rant, but I'm, I am a big, no. a big champion of a hopeful world. Yes, and uh, I think we need it uh, really. And I see that, uh, you know, when we are literally coming apart, you know, when we say that, you know, I can't cope up, I am not able to go through the day and I don't know what the world has come to. I think these words need a change of thought. It needs a change of inspiration, uh, a change of hope. And, you know, like how you beautifully dissected it and took it back to the ground level and say, imagine from where the hope starts and, uh, you know, literally how it really touches us and, uh, and how I think I'm responsible for creating that hope for somebody else. And I am a big uh, believer and, a, uh, it's, you know, really a pusher of this as well. But uh, sometimes I get swamped, uh, you know, uh, with my own kids to say, okay, now uh, stop second act, you know, <laughs> kind of preaching. But I just feel that, yes, every one of us has a responsibility and also an action of staying positive and creating a really happy and uh, very sorted world, I think, you know, and what you're doing is commendable, I have to say. And also um, continuing to do it and uh, being innovative about it and also traveling the way you're traveling and what you're doing also with uh, different tribes. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you were already in Tanzania doing something and in Kabul teaching. And I don't even know, when did you start and how did you get there? I mean, I'm, it's, it's very intriguing. I want to know more about it, but with limited time, I have lots of questions. So maybe I'll take this on the side one day when I meet you. Um, yes. <laughs> the next one I want to ask you is about, of course, your lyrics writing and, uh, you know, are you still continuing um, one? And second, um, the, the songs that you have written are sung by, of course, Amitabh Bachchan, Paran Akhtar, Rekha Bhardwaj. Uh, how does that make you feel? And um, what emotion do you carry from there? Mm. Uh, yes, I, I write. Music is very much in my DNA. I, I love melodies and I love words and language. Uh, so I, I'm still writing. Um, not for as much, I would say, for mainstream films, but I, I do write a lot for, uh, you know, offbeat independent films or ad films. And so the work doesn't stop uh, in that sense for lyrics writing. I write for myself also. I, I a, lot, a lot of times spend down. And Dehradun is often a beautiful place to, you know, find words and visuals that will replicate that emotion. Um, and... The second question about having these phenomenal people sing my songs and give their voice, it is a, it it is a it's 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 a big promise. I think what is possible for people who don't come from Bombay, who are not born in uh, you know film city or around it, who don't come from that legacy. I want my songs to be reminder of that promise. That yes, if you are passionate enough, it will get through. Uh, Mr. Bachchan singing a song is, of course, the thrill of a lifetime, you know. So many times I'm at uh, the Delhi airport and they will play the song in uh, one of the stores and, you know, you listen to it and you feel like, wow, that's that came out of your pen and your paper and it has come to serve so many people. I see my music as, uh, again, really a, a song of my belief uh, that that things are possible. I had no connection to the film world. Uh, and now, you know, there are these amazing outputs that, that I got, uh, get to put my name with stalwarts uh, alongside. 
and so for me uh, they are gentle reminders and they are also uh, songs of promises so which song was this which mr bachan sang do you want to talk it's about it's called atrangi yari it's called atrangi yari from the movie wazir yes it's a beautiful song and what did farhan akhtar sing uh so no so mr bachan and farhan akhtar actually did a duet ah okay All and right. they sang the song together okay. yeah. I, i thought maybe there's another separate song and you also did some poetry i know um uh, so you also got an award for that uh if it's mm-hmm. a short piece do you want to and if you remember do you want to put it here so that we can hear it oh wow uh i have a whole poetry book actually that came oh. before 50 toughest question um okay. and i write poetry uh because you know lyrics writing is poetry just put with melody um i can just recite to you a latest piece uh oh. main uski fikr mein jo ab tak paya nahi main uski fikr mein jo ab tak paya nahi bhool jata hu wo bhi jo ab tak gawaya nahi main uski fikr mein jo ab tak paya nahi bhool jata hu wo bhi jo ab tak gawaya nahi udhari ki zindagi mein khwabon ki apni qeemat hai dhoop behisab hai magar छाव भी है गनीमत है कितनी ही आवाजों ने मेरा ये नाम अब तक भुलाया नहीं मैं उसकी फिक्र में जो अब तक पाया नहीं भूल जाता हूँ वो भी जो अब तक गवाया नहीं humble what a human being you are i mean i am losing words to uh, applaud you uh, deepak really and i'm so glad that sarika gave me your introduction this platform really needs people like you and i cannot just thank you enough for being here today um thank you i have to ask you of course my very mandated question uh, which is okay. what is your second act because this is a mm. second act podcast and whatever you feel you can describe second act is for yourself mm-hmm. what is that second act that you're seeking what is your second act uh actually i mean it might come off as a surprise my answer to you but i think our lives are the second act honestly we come trailing the first act on the prized glory of everybody who came before us mm-hmm. and laid the path mm-hmm. my 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 grandfather's father despite the challenges in in his lifetime had to say let me live enough to build a family and then raise children who will be all right my grandfather despite the fact that he was uh, you know working in the army during partition and all the pain and all that during the british era that he saw had to have hope and resilience and courage to say let me despite these odds uh bring up a family and and raise beautiful children and but for my father to do that with his life so that when i was born i didn't have to scrounge for freedom uh you know on on an aesthetic level of of a country i didn't have to go out looking scrounging for food those luxuries were the first act and we we uh i think when we are born with the certain amount of privilege that we are this life is a second act and sometimes we think that the hardships were of the first act but yes somebody survived them and so many of us feel like failures because we fail to acknowledge everybody who succeeded before us uh, you know uh, james baldwin has a beautiful line that he says our crown is already paid for and i think all we have to do in our <laughs> act is wear the crown and so i actually see this life as a second act uh uh-huh. and everybody who came before me as the first act um and and to do it enough so that when somebody else i become the first act in somebody else's story uh i can i can he- hold my head in equal power and prestige high up for the next generation so that when their second act begins they don't feel alone and they don't feel um you know smeared down by the challenges they they can feel that somebody stood in the place they have uh the obstacle greeting them and so their second act becomes an act of revolution and an act of reverence for everybody who came before them 
I think this question has taught me so many perspectives about how I need to think of second act. And I haven't heard such a profound answer to it so far, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, the way you articulate, the way you go back, um, you know, and um, bring in such deep realization to this word now. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to say, but it's, it's really thought provoking. It's brought in another meaning to the second act platform. It's beautiful and thank you. I mean, you know, yes, I hope that you become that first act in somebody's life to really have a very fulfilling second act for them. Uh, now to close this, I have some rapid fire questions for you. <clears throat> okay. So <laughs> Deepa, um, tell me one thing that has always motivated you. I would say poetry has motivated me always. Beautiful. And if you go back to being 17 again, is there anything still that Deepak would like to change? Uh, yes, care less about uh, my bullies and, uh, you know, yeah, own my story much earlier. Oh, beautiful. Deepak wants to be the poet, the lyricist uh, going forward or a writer. What do you enjoy more? All of it. I don't know <laughs> anything in the world that I don't enjoy. I mean, I, I think after working for so many years, and uh, I've come to a place where I will not do things that I don't like. And there are things I just do for myself. Uh, but uh, I love all of it. And I don't honestly, Arjuna, see them as jobs. Uh, I, I write because when I have a new thought, I have now trained myself to have the option of saying, do I want to write a song about this? Do I want to write a poem about this? Do oh, I want right. to teach it in a classroom in form <laughs> of a curriculum? So I see this as a toolbox, hmm. all of these different jobs as toolboxes. And when I feel something, I can choose a tool and then you know express through it. So I am actually more excited about being more of myself and, and you know picking up more skills. I want to pick up pottery and I want to pick up you know uh, installation art and all of that. Uh, for me, all of these are means of expressing, not means of being. I think the being is already hmm. very, very uh, crystallized and it is just, you know, layering itself up. Uh, the doing can be diversified, can, can be had fun with. So I am, I'm not worried about whether I'll write more, whether I'll speak more. I think all of it, I hope, uh, you know, not just one. I want to be the jack of all trades till I die. So mm -hmm. I hope I, I, can, I can do it all by then and more, all the way more. So what does Deepak do when he's feeling low? Uh, eat aloo parantas to start with. Um, <laughs> I, I uh, eat aloo parantas definitely. I have something called the first aid box for the soul. Um, when I am very happy with something, someone, a song, a piece of poetry, a book, a person, I make a note of it in, in my uh, Google folder. And whenever I'm having a low day, I start by listening to the 11 songs there are, uh, then go to the 21 quotes there are. If nothing works, I pick up the phone on the, you know, now 13 people on the list. And by the time I'm speaking to the third person, I, I have spent almost four hours with things I love and things that have brought me joy at some point of life. So that's my coping mechanism. Or I will just go silent and just just absorb myself in art and 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 you know things around that that's what i do when i'm having a bad day very nice and one last question what do you want the listeners uh, to go back with after this podcast through a conversation with us i think i've overloaded them with a lot of <laughs> metaphors and philosophies already <clears throat> but i would like for them to go back knowing that each one of us is dispensable. We live our lives with the notion that we are indispensable, uh, but we all are dispensable. Uh, and there is freedom to knowing that because then you can be more courageous. You can be more exemplary. You can be more ambitious. You can be more risk-taking when you realize that uh, everything can be fixed in the world. You don't have to be so cautious about every single thing. You don't have to blow a breath under every decision. Uh, you can be mindful, but you have to come to a point where you can live more uh, courageously. And courage is 
as Maya Angelou, the great African-American author says, the most important virtue of all virtues, because without courage, you can be, uh, you know, consistently kind. With courage, you can be consistently inspiring. Uh, otherwise, you'll be sporadic. And so if you can live ambitiously, um, and a lot of people ask me, how to do that? How do you live? You know, what is the how to that? And the how to that is, don't treat your talent like your gift. Treat it like your responsibility. You know, don't be moody and flaky about it. Uh, take, take ownership and accountability and see what you can do with best with it. Uh, so yeah, that would be my request and suggestion. Wow. It's a very powerful podcast, I have to say. And uh, you made it every, um, every conversation or every sentence that we spoke so worth it. So thank you again. And um, I am hoping that, uh, you know, I can be more in touch one day, maybe the 14th person you can go back to, you never know, <laughs> on live treats. Mm, so, thank yeah. so thanks again, Deepak. It's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Archana. Really enjoyed this. Thank you.